Welcome everybody to the school committee meeting of Wednesday, May 13th, 2020. Once again, joining you remotely. Uh, first order of business this evening is approval of minutes. So we do have a number of minutes to approve tonight, starting with our business minute, um, business meeting minutes from April 29th, 2020. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Motion to approve. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Maya. All in favor of the April 29th minutes? Aye. 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 Great, unanimous. Um, then we have executive session minutes from April 29th. Um, those are in two parts again. So the first part, which was pages one and two, uh, were all five of us. Um, is there a motion to approve pages one and two of these session on April 29th? So moved. Thank you, Mark. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Dave. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Unanimous. Then there was um, page three, uh, the second part of the executive session on April 29th. That was just uh, four of us. Mara Smith was not in attendance for that. Motion to approve. So moved. Thank you, Dave. Second. All second. Thank you, Maya. All in favor? Aye. 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 Four Aye. abstention. Abstain. Okay, great. Four zero one abstention. Um, and then we also had executive session on Monday, May 11th. Um, again, that was just the four of us. Uh, Ms. Smith was not at that meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Maya. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstention. Thank you, Mark. Okay, four, zero, and one. Um, next on our agenda is correspondence. Dr. Thompson? Yes, uh, we have a, uh, a letter from the general manager, uh, Tony Mizuko, uh, dated the 12th of May, this past Tuesday. Uh, Dr. Thompson, I'm writing to you regarding my recommendation on continuing to pay costs associated with the extended day program offered by NPS. Norwood has continued to pay all employees throughout this challenging time, and we are committed to doing the best for our employees and our residents during such a challenging time. My recommendation is to continue to pay all extended day employees their regular salaries for the end of the school year, which would constitute the normal end of the program. This will lead to a cost of approximately 150 to 200,000, which I propose a town meeting to take from free cash or from an existing source in the budget as the end of year transfer. This is the most, most fiscally prudent way to manage the potentially enormous unemployment liability. We are living in unprecedented times, so while the expenditure of this nature would be questionable during normal times, no one could have foreseen schools closed for months. There is a practicality and the potential risk associated with unemployment. As a direct pay employer, we would be responsible for at least 50%, uh, 50 possibly up to 70% of the salary for any employee laid off. Furthermore, due to quirks in unemployment, we'd be required to continue to pay unemployment into the summer and possibly into the fall if we did not run an extended day program in the fall. While it appears that the lower cost option would be to pay the unemployment, there is a, would be to pay the unemployment, there's a substantial risk that our total costs would not only meet the exact payroll cost, but would exceed it. One final consideration is the 2008 recession extensions to unemployment lasted for a great deal of time, some people having been unemployed for upwards of a year or more. While well, Congress has not authorized any employment extension, should the current situation turn into a longer recessionary environment, we could potentially be paying unemployment for a year. We have to balance the potential risk with the need to provide maximum savings and the value for the the taxpayer. However, in this case, I believe going with the apparent cheaper option amounts to a gamble with taxpayer dollars and should be avoided. I will be recommending an internal transfer or other allocation of funds as needed to satisfy these costs through the end of the fiscal year and program year. Please contact me with any questions. Signed, Tony Bazooka. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Any further correspondence at this time? No, there is not, Madam Chair. All right, so next on our agenda is warrants. Uh, Dave Catania, do you have a report on the warrants that you signed on behalf of the committee? I do. Okay, um, starting with $49,491.33, uh, $1,255.54, $45,389.26, $31,040.11, $7,126.42, $64,549.35, $28,373.70, 
$126,069.43 for a grand total of $353,295.14. Thank you, Dave. Any questions from the committee on those warrants? Nope. All right. So moving right along, next on our agenda is public forum. Uh, I am just checking the email address that we created for this purpose. I do not see any emails, but just as a reminder to the community, um, you can email us at NPS school committee at norward.k12.ma.us at any time. And anything we receive at that email address will be read at our next public forum. Uh, Dr. Thompson, do you have any announcements this evening? Uh, no, I'll, I'll wrap them into the superintendent's report. Okay. So next on our agenda, um, this is the annual meeting where we are supposed to discuss school choice uh, for the school committee members. We do have a memo in our packet from Dr. Thompson. Um, Dr. Thompson, would you like to guide us through the memo on this topic? Sure. Uh, the memo dated uh, May 4th uh, to the members of the Norwood School Committee from myself uh, regarding school choice. As you know, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 76, Section uh, 12B requires the Norwood School Department to enroll non-resident students unless the school committee votes by June 1st, 2020, not to participate in the school choice program. Based on the following reasons, the superintendent recommends that the Norwood School Committee vote to not participate in school choice during the 2020-2021 year. First, enrollment in Norwood is increasing and has been re relatively volatile in certain grades with particular schools and shortly will be reaching capacity of enrollments for some existing school sites. Choice students once enrolled are in the system's responsibility until graduation or, gra or age 22 for special education students and may pose overcrowding in certain schools or courses. The income stream for schools uh, for choice students is on a declining scale with less income per pupil this year than last year. Three, nor would be subsidizing the cost of educating each uh, school choice student and that our per pupil expenditure is above the uh, maximum allowable reimbursement. Four, uh, a student may enroll in a regular education as a regular education student with 5,000 as reimbursement, then apply for a, for a team evaluation and special education services exceeding the 5,000, uh, which will then be paid by the Norwood Public Schools. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. So as a committee, we do need to vote on this. Um, is there a motion from the committee? Motion to... Um, opt not to participate in school choice. Thank you, Maya. Was there a second? Second, second by Mara. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is that Aye. unanimous? Yes. Okay. Five zero. Thank you. All right. So moving right along, um, we do have an appearance this evening. Uh, so welcome to Mr. Eli Norris, uh, Ms. Erin Long, and Ms. Kelsey Massas, who are here this evening to give us an update on our food services, uh, the programming, and the budget. Uh, so thank you to the three of you for joining us. Hope all of you are doing well. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, we're very excited to be back tonight and uh, share with the committee uh, and the and the community uh, a lot of the things that have been going on this year, especially in the last uh, the last few uh, weeks or the last couple of months at this point. Uh, so we we put together a presentation. I will now attempt to share my screen. <laughs> Dr. Thompson trained me for this exact moment. Oh, God help it. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Yep. There we go. I think it's working. All right, we see the presentation? Yes. Perfect, okay. Um, so when the last time we were here back in the fall, we laid out our plan for the school year. Uh, so during this presentation, we're gonna take a look back and, and see, you know, see how we delivered. Uh, I'm joined tonight by the one and only Kelsey Massa. Uh, and of course, the incomparable Mrs. Aaron Long, uh, our regional manager. Um, so one of the first things is a, a fun thing that we did. Last year, we had a staff meeting uh, and an idea came up of, of having a, uh, a scholarship, a food service scholarship. Uh, it's open to all graduating seniors, uh, but it's really aimed at students that are going into the hospitality field. Uh, so we were able to raise over $500. Uh, so there will be the first scholarship uh, announced soon. 
Uh, all the applications are already in and we're combing through them, but it was something that we we're excited to be able to offer uh, to, to a graduating Norwood student. Uh, this was back, this event was back in November and it, it seems like it was years ago, but we coordinated a, a free community dinner. Uh, we worked with some local partners such as Polar Beverage in Worcester uh, and American Patriot Sale right here in Norwood uh, to secure the food and the drink. And then the food service department volunteered their time and their talents uh, to prepare the food. Uh, and then Dr. Thompson and all the building principals chipped in and helped serve. Uh, so it was, a, it was a real team effort. Everyone was involved. Uh, we even had Chief Brooks and his, his team from the police department make sure that, uh, you know, the, they were the security to make sure that no one uh, got out of hand or, or gobbled too loudly. But it was a, a, a real fun event. Uh, we had a, a lot of fun with it and we're hoping to do it, do it again in the future, uh, you know, when we get back to, you know, quote unquote normal. Um, but let's get cooking. So this is one of, uh, one of Chartwell's concepts is the Discovery Kitchen. Uh, each month, there's different themes and activities that we do both inside the CAF and also in the classroom. Uh, some of the hits this year were seed to table, uh, where we planted uh, basil into little milk cartons at the Cleveland and the Willet, and then we sampled the basil tofu stir fry. Uh, another of the themes was uh, we made a, a green monster kale smoothie over at the Callahan, which was a lot of fun. Uh, another one that we did was about locally grown. Uh, we did this one outside at the Prescott and we had the students, uh, they harvested tomatoes and cucumbers right out of, uh, right out of the, the raised bed gardens that are in front of the, in front of the school. Uh, one of the most fun events that we did was a, a tower garden event. Uh, Mr. Downs class over at the Callahan, uh, they planted the seeds, they tracked the growth of the tower garden. Uh, and then we brought all of our kitchen equipment over uh, and we prepared a few dishes right with ingredients right from the right from the tower garden. It was a lot of fun. Um, on the on the left hand side is is something that we're pretty pretty excited that we got in, and a little bummed out that we didn't get to fully roll it out. Uh, but it's our mobile discovery teaching kitchen. Uh, it's designed to roll right into a classroom or a small space, uh, and it gives students uh, time hands on experience with with fresh ingredients. Uh, it has a monitor that that hooks up to it so the kids can see the action and then it has some tables that pop off on the side uh, so we can have some students up and get their hands dirty um, so it's we're looking forward to rolling that out further uh, next next year and beyond but it was uh, we got it in and we got to do a, a few test classrooms with it so it'd be a fun uh, a fun good addition to our our repertoire All right, so moving into student choice, this was a program that we implemented last year at the high school. It's a Chartwell's K-12 concept to allow students to have that voice when it comes to their menu and what they want to see offered. So it was such a success for the first year that we obviously continued it for this year where we got through about two rounds where students could sample and vote for a new menu station concept that they could see on the menu for a month or two months or however long with the frequency we wanted to keep it going. Go so, so again, huge success and we look forward to hopefully continuing that um, come next year at the high school. And when it came to the middle school, we really wanted to see what we could do to focus on this grade level, to engage students a little bit more. So after meeting with the principal, we had decided why not partner up with the cooking elective students there? So we actually did some fun and exciting ways of implementing student choice at the middle school as well. So this kind of shows you some snapshots of social media where what we did is we actually used them as student ambassadors to be the ones that they came in first and we allowed them to do the prep work and the assembling of the items that we were gonna sample. And they actually were the ones that got to choose the two stations that then their peers would sample and vote on. So it was it was great for them to actually be in that kitchen and have the hands on experience and the learning experience of what it's like to work in an industrial type kitchen. And then the next day when we went to go cook the items, we actually had them help with sampling and uh, handing out those samples, getting students to vote. So it was a great way for it to come from students to have their peers be involved with what was on the menu. So you can see we did about 800 samples for each event and our winning stations for the two rounds that we ended up doing at the middle school was bok choy and flame. So 
So waste reduction, this is another thing that we continue to do what we can do to obviously help our planet in any way possible. So we've come a long way with a lot of the programs and initiatives that we've done, where this year we really wanted to focus on composting. So you can see a couple snapshots of the smaller level that's done at the elementary schools right now. I believe this was at the Prescott with um, a composting station they have there. But we took it to another level to do it in the back of house with our kitchens, where we actually diverted all the back of house food scraps to then be sent daily to either the town composting center or even to some local animal farms and partner with some of our staff in the Norwood Public School System. So a great initiative. We look forward to continue that next year, as you can see, just with some of the statistics that we averaged of 21 gallons per day that we were collecting and providing approximately 105 pounds. And it was estimated annually when it came to the end of the school year, we would hope to achieve getting to about the 18,270 pounds. So mood boost, this might be something that we have heard about with what we've done the past couple months at the elementary level, but a new Chartwell's K-12 menu concept where it can be for the elementary or the middle school level where it's really helping kids get that connection and that understanding of what they eat and how it affects their mood and really helping them develop those healthy eating patterns. So this was a super exciting program for us to implement and we enjoyed doing it where we launched it at the elementary level where at all schools, they had the opportunity to taste some recipe items that were highlighted to feature ingredients that have been known through evidence-based research that, you know, they've been known that they may promote boosting qualities such as feelings of strength, um, calm, confident, happiness. Those are just some of them. So well-received program. The kids loved it. Uh, did tastings throughout the elementary schools. And then we also so made also concepts on the menu itself so kids could continue to try it and they'd be given little giveaways for trying those items and getting them on their tray as it was offered on the menu. So awesome program. And we had planned to do it at Coakley Middle School at the more of that uh, higher age level in April, but hopefully to be continued next year with that piece. And lastly, we had some excitement at the high school a couple months ago. We had applied for a grant for us to do an alternative breakfast program there. And we actually were awarded, you can see in one of the pictures, it's a fuel up to play 60 breakfast cart where you can offer a grab and go breakfast option for kids to grab from the lobby. Because we know it can be difficult for kids to trek all the way down to the dining hall where we wanted to make sure that they were still getting access to a complete meal. So um New England Dairy Council was in partnership with really providing that cart. So we had Chase Winovich from the New England Patriots come out to do a, an appearance with our kickoff celebration. We had somebody from a local dairy farm as well. So as you can see, it was a huge success. And we look forward to continuing offering breakfast and making sure that our kids get fed. And, and that's right about when the wheels fell off of our school year. <laughs> uh, we, we, we laid out a plan back in the fall, uh, and then, you know, the couple weeks into March, it fell upside down. Uh, in the weeks leading up to the closure, we were certainly busy creating uh, a variety of contingency plans uh, for any number of the ways in which it could have played out. Um, but once it was official, uh, we sprang into action. School was canceled on a Friday. We were up and running with the meal service on Monday. Uh, keeping in mind that in the very early stages of the closure, th there was a lot of unknowns uh, around the regulations and which waivers were in place uh, or if it would be approved by the USDA. Uh, but we were immediately able to open up two meal sites, uh, both the Balch and the Callahan School. And that was solely based on our successful implementation last, uh, last summer of our summer meals program. Uh, this got our foot in the door. Uh, and then the following week, we, we kicked that door wide open. Uh, we continue to work closely with the uh, Mass Department of Education uh, to, to further open the program and we opened up three additional sites. Uh, so we were able to provide meals at all five of our community elementary schools. Uh, and these are just a few of the, the behind the scenes photos of, of how it's operating uh, and the ladies still going above and beyond every day with 
uh, you know, writing fun, uh, fun food puns and, and messages, uh, you know, messages of hope on the on the lunch bags. Um, all sites are currently open from 11 to 1, Monday through Friday. Uh, and on Fridays, or if it's a Friday's a holiday, the last day of the week, we'll give out enough meals to cover for Saturday and Sunday. Uh, the program is free to all kids and teens, 18 years and younger. Uh, there's no registration. The child does not need to be present in order for the parent or the caregiver to pick up meals. Um, the child does not have to be enrolled in Nord Public Schools. It could be home, the child could be homeschooled or, or go to a private school. Um, it's open. It's open to everyone, anyone 18 and under. Uh, we've noticed that we don't see too many high school aged uh, kids and teens coming down. So we just want to also remind them that it's 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 open. It's available at the five community schools. Uh, even though meals are not being served from the high school, they can they can hit one of the community schools and get it. Uh, and also just to let them know that Wednesday is pizza day. I know that's very important. Um, <laughs> We're offering at least two, two options daily. Uh, one is a cold option that can be consumed immediately. Uh, the second is a, uh, a packaged option, which you see here on the screen. Uh, that's We serve it cold, but it has to be heated up at home. So it could be uh, pasta and meatballs. It could be a chicken pot pie uh, or you know chicken nuggets and, and something like that. So a variety of things, uh, both able to consume right away or take home and, and reheat. Uh, we were also tapped by uh, Tony Mazuka over at Town Hall, uh, and he asked us to look into making looking to making dinners. Um, within a few weeks, we're able to get a program up and running using the high school kitchen. Uh, so each of the meals has been packaged uh, family style with about eight to ten servings per pan, and it's been uh, it's been a successful successful program so far. So it it goes without saying, but I'll I'll say it regardless, but none of this would have been possible without the entire food service department staff uh, really jumping in with both feet. Uh, the vast majority of our associates, they live in town. They, they either have children that are currently in the system or they have children that have graduated through the system. Um, I'm, I'm almost certain that they'd all prefer to, to be home, staying safe uh, from the uncertainty of the situation, but each one of them have answered the call and, and really jumped right in. Uh, the staff care about the community and they've really gone uh, above and beyond and they've been on the front line since day one uh, and i can't thank them enough for everything that they've been able to accomplish it's been fantastic uh, so when we started this service uh, we launched at, at the two sites and we served 60 meals uh, 60 lunches and 60 breakfasts across two sites on the first day um, now that we're a couple months in we're, we're averaging just under 3,000 meals per day uh, for each day of service, uh, so it's the the need has certainly grown. Um, we we were increasing slowly, uh, and then it really spiked up, uh, and now we've kind of leveled out with the number of meals, breakfasts, and lunches that we're doing daily. Uh, but that gives you a, a snapshot of where we are: uh, seventy-two thousand meals served as of Friday. Uh, as of today, we're around seventy-seven thousand um, seventy-seven thousand meals. So I get the fun stuff to talk about, money and budgets and all that. So, and I want to just kind of um, reiterate some of Eli's earlier points um, in terms of the numbers of meals. I, I work with 12 school districts in the state of Massachusetts and everyone except one school district, which is a regional high school, is doing emergency meals. And I take meal counts daily from all these schools because we're rolling up reports on a daily basis. And uh, I think because of the dedication of Nor Eli and the Norwood team and how quickly they were able to ramp up and also get the support of the community, they're doing 25 to 30% of the kids are, are in, in, enrolled in school are eating on a daily basis where my averages in other school districts are maybe at 10 to 15% and some even less. So despite you know efforts on, for, from all of the food service departments in a lot of school districts, it just seems like um, Norwood just is, is rising above the pack a little bit. So I did want to share that with you just as a comparison. So as Eli mentioned, the wheels falling off <laughs> in March, um, we were trending very well financially you know, through February, hitting our uh, budgetary goals as far as the bottom line for the program is concerned. And then obviously when March hit and we had the you know, labor expenses um, built into the program and we weren't serving as many meals as we are now, 
you know, March was a, a heavy hitting uh, loss of 23,000. But as we serve more meetings and the Medina program opened up, obviously the financials are looking much, much better. And by the end of the school year, despite the fact that we're not serving a traditional school lunch program, we're gonna probably um, come in even better than the $38,000 on this slide because Eli and I were kind of talking uh, earlier this afternoon and realized that we had not included the dinner meal income. So in other words, uh, the Norwood Bank, you know, donated generously for this uh, dinner program and that income has is not reflected in the projections. Mm -hmm. So our, the bottom line for the school lunch program should be very uh, in, a good, in a good position despite the fact that March um, happened and no one expected that. We'll definitely end up in the black for the program this year, I think, due to all these extraordinary measures that the food service department has been taking since uh, the COVID-19 hit. And then there's always the planning part. So as far as the summer program, Eli mentioned earlier that as a result of Norwood being in the summer food service program um, and, and eligible for it, that's why we had such a, a an easier transition than other school districts. Any school district that was previously serving meals through the summer food service program was automatically given, um, you know, approval to start um, a feeding program pretty pretty quickly. It was those districts that did not prior prior to March have a summer feeding program that had to go through a little bit more red tape. So because Norwood was fortunate enough to have had a summer food service program. We also reaped the benefit, reaped the benefit of having a higher of reimbursement rate for all those meals that were served. So from an income perspective, that certainly helped what we're doing currently. So right now, um, the DESE has sent out an application for the upcoming summer um, for districts that had previously had programs. And it's business as usual in terms of applying for that, applying. but we're still awaiting oh, guidance on what the actual service will look like if they will allow congregate feeding, non-congregate feeding, um, and what the rules will be. Our expectations are sort of that for the rest of the summer, um, it'll be exactly as it is now with pickup locations, but that remains to be seen. So we're just waiting for some guidance um, from the DESC on that. And as, as the slide shows that 5,000 lunches were served last summer. So there may be a greater need this summer um, and we're just kind of going by the DESE's guidance for the time being, but, but awaiting further information. information. And then for the school year, um, yeah. obviously, as I'm sure you're all grappling with as well, uh, we don't know exactly what next school year is going to look like, but um, please be confident that Eli and I and Kelsey and the rest of the Chartwell's K-12 team are already in planning mode for a variety of scenarios. And I guess the one thing that I would like to impress upon the group tonight, if I can, is that it, we, if you just please keep us in mind as any planning and um, considerations are being made for what the school year will look like next year in Norwood that you remember, um, the food service department in those planning meetings because as accommodating as I think we try to be in all the school districts that we are in and we're, we're in a service industry and that's our primary focus is to serve. Um, we're not going to be able to turn on a dime as well as we have in the past and it's going to take a lot more um, planning and forethought for whatever service model might be considered for Norwood and it could range in each school. Um, Chartwells, I'm on a task force right now. No, Chartwell Chart K 12 is putting together a, um, a a playbook, if you will, for different types of service that may be required as a result of school looking much different in September. Um, classroom feeding, uh, take home meals on the bus. We understand that the school day may may look completely different in terms of how many kids are in the building at any one time, or there may be split shifts, or um, space may move beyond the classroom and maybe there'll be classrooms in the gym and auditorium and all of that. And whatever, whatever. it is that um, is going to be considered, we'd like to just be part of that planning so we can, you know, turn as quickly as possible when, when needed. 
So with that, I think we will take questions. Thank you, Eli and Aaron and, and Kelsey so much. Um, Kelsey and Eli are already here from me all the time and <laughs> no, I think that they're amazing and I'm so appreciative of everything that they've been doing. So I won't speak too much right now. I'll open it up to the rest of my colleagues for feedback or questions. Um, anything from anybody on the committee, Mara? Yeah, um, I just wanna, well, first of all, thank you, Aaron, Kelsey and, and Eli for this presentation and bringing us up to speed on what's been happening. It's, it's um, so odd to see the the pictures from the beginning half of the year it's like when you turn on tv now and you're like wait people are close <laughs> shouldn't be happening um, but it was also just incredibly reassuring to see those images and get a sense of what normal looks like and the idea that we can we can go back to that so i want to first of all just say congratulations to the three of you for an amazing year up until the point <laughs> that the wheels came off the wagon and the entire world changed um but beyond that beyond i just want to say wanna and say. i think i can say confidently i think i speak on behalf of the committee and the rest of the community that you all and the ladies, the ladies who are working who are... to hand out those meals are are nothing short of heroes in my mind and Every time I see an image of what you all are doing and I get a report like this, I'm just reminded of that Mr. Rogers quote where he talks about when there are scary things in the news that his mom always said to look for the helpers and that you'll always find that there are people that are helping. And I think that, you know, so much of what this whole thing has meant for, for kids is every sense of normalcy is gone. And the fact that you all are able to get give that sense of food security for people that that otherwise may not have it. And that's just really witnessed in the numbers. And that there is in this time when everyone has to be so insular, a place in the community that everyone knows that they can go and be safe and get what they need. I just think that it's, it's, it's really, really something really to something be commended. Different. And I had for one forgotten that you were up and running on Monday and that is insane. <laughs> We closed on Friday and you were up and running on Monday. So that's just incredibly impressive. And what you all have been able to do in such a short amount of time is is nothing short of amazing. So I, I would extend my incredible thanks. And I, I, I think I can say the thanks of the community for all that the three of you and the entire staff um, of the food services um, has done. It's really, it's really quite, quite something. Thank you. Yeah, Dave Um, I, Morris said it best. I mean, you guys are absolutely amazing. Uh, we're Norwood's very lucky to have such a great team and, and everyone doing this on our on behalf of our, our students and families. Um, I want to just follow up. You said uh, keep you guys in mind. Can you give us a sense of any things that need to be changed? Uh, you know, how um, our changes will affect what you need to change, just so we get a sense of what what you're going to have to adjust. Eli, do you want me to take that as an example kind of scenario? You're on the task force. <laughs> uh, so without knowing exactly what classrooms and student enrollment and what will happen in school buildings, we've been speculating as a group. So I'm on this task force, as I mentioned, and one of the other people that are on the task force with me is one of my food service directors. His name is Tom from Brockton public schools, and we already have a robust uh, breakfast in the classroom program in Brockton, which we have developed over the last five years. So we're using that sort of as a model to say, okay, if we have to do feeding in the classrooms, what things can we adopt from this program and expand it into lunch? But the, the challenge will be, um, for example, you know, with high school element, middle, elementary, middle, and high school students, they all have different needs and, and there may be a, a desire to keep elementary kids in the classroom and then middle school and high school kids maybe not so much. Um, and then not knowing exactly how many students are gonna be in the building and where they're gonna be, there's just the logistics of planning whether or not we'll be allowed to deliver meals or will the kids come down to the cafeteria and pick up coolers on wheels? Do we have to purchase any additional equipment such as insulated bags that would hold cold food and hot food and how do we get that expeditiously to the classrooms um, so it's it's a lot of deciding on a menu deciding on what's going to work 
And then do we need equipment, electricity? Are there elevators in the building or not? How do we get the, the transportation pieces up the stairs if there is no elevator, for example? Or are we gonna look at serving? You know, someone said to me today that they had heard a rumor that kids would come to school, but they would only be there half the day and they would leave even before lunch began. And maybe we would just do bag lunches for those students as they leave the building. So without really knowing exactly what the school day will look like and how frequently kids will be in the buildings as those kinds of things are talked about and somewhat um, debated it would be nice if we could be a part of that discussion just so we're kind of going along with the planning as it's happening thank you uh, that makes perfect sense thank you very much you're welcome and i think the biggest challenge similar to the ppe equipment that was uh, scarce when the pandemic first hit. We've been hearing from our vendors that, you know, some school districts are already starting to buy equipment, portable type equipment like bags on, on, on uh, wheels or racks or carts. Um, and there's a concern that if it, it's kind of putting the cart before the horse, if you don't know exactly what's going to happen. But if we wait too long to consider a plan, we could be not, we could not have the equipment that we need come September. So that's the conversation I had with my whole team, Eli being one of my team members today, is I said, we have to start having these discussions soon because there's gonna be a, a massive run on this kind of equipment, portable stuff. And if we don't order it quickly enough, we won't be prepared for September. So I said, it's a catch 22 because you don't want the school districts to spend money unnecessarily for equipment we may or may not need. And we may only need it for a short period of time but if we don't have it, we're going to be behind the eight ball from the get go. Yeah, Mara. Um, just off of that, I think back to one of my earlier comments about how it was so impressive that you all were able to be up and running on the Monday after schools closed. I think something that's worth just kind of highlighting of what you just said, um, Aaron, which I think is really important, is that in this situation, I think the most important thing we can do as a town and a school system is to be forward thinking and to not just be reactionary. And to your point, I think that not that I want to say, let's go buy all of this tomorrow, right? But I think we all can be in agreement that most likely school will look different. We don't know exactly how. So I think we do need some more information just so that we're, we're planning correctly. But I think just as you said, it, it strikes me that the way that this is going to work, and that's proven by the fact that you are really able to be up and running so quickly and to be adaptable with what the town needs is to be forward thinking and planning in that way. So just to, I know I, uh, my time on this committee is, is short lived. So just to, uh, to kind of put my two cents into, to advocate that, um, that, that we, we take that, um, that my colleagues take that, um, that sentiment to heart. Thank you. Other questions or feedback from members of the committee? No, um, just a couple of things. Um, Kelsey did a really great webinar uh, last Thursday for Impact Norwood on the how the food impacts your moods, um, and it was recorded. If anybody would like to check that out, it's on the Impact Norwood website. Um, but Kelsey, thank you for you know being involved in our community in, in that way. Yes, thank you for having me. That was uh, that was fun. And if you want to learn how to make some macamole, be sure to uh, tune in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do have to try that recipe you shared. It looked it looks very good. And uh, my eight year old was watching the webinar with me, and he was like, that? and I was like, we have none of the ingredients today. And the next time I go to the grocery store, we will make it. But, uh, <laughs> everybody had frozen peas in their freezer. <laughs> <laughs> Our frozen peas are actually uh, ice packs for if you get injured. That's what we use uh, for for injuries in my house. I don't know if I want to use those peas. They've been around for quite a while, and on a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. um, so, thank you for doing that webinar. Yes. Can peas no good? Can peas? Well, I think you could try. I feel like maybe it might be a different flavor. I mean, I, I'm a personal fan of canned peas, but with the whole macamole thing, maybe stick with fresh or frozen. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I also just wanted to extend thanks to both uh, Kelsey and Eli for being part of our school health council that we rejuvenated this week, uh, this year, excuse me. Um, and at our next meeting, uh, Ryan Quigley is going to be joining us to give us an update on the school health council and the wellness policy that we've all been working on. But Eli and Kelsey have been very critical in, in that. So thank you to both of you for that. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions or updates from anybody around food services at this time? No. Well, although you're more than welcome to, you know, hang out with us for a little while longer, I also will not be offended if you decide to to leave our meeting <laughs> at this time. Um, so thank you for for all you've done and all that any of you all continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You Have too. Night. Thanks so much. All right, so moving along, Dr. Thompson, uh, your report and late agenda. Yes, uh, just a few things. Uh, first, um, and I did uh, give an announcement out Monday evening to the uh, Old Ham community, but just to make it uh, town-wide, uh, we have chosen a, a new principal for the Old Ham School. He will start July 1. Uh, Stephen Olson will be uh, joining us. Uh, he is the chief academic officer right now at Seven Hills Charter School in Worcester. Uh, and he is uh, right now planning to spend some time with us, probably virtually, but uh, with groups over the spring. Going forward, we're very excited to have him uh, join us. Uh, the other thing is that um, I am going to do another Facebook uh, Live um, event. Thank you, uh, Teresa. Uh, I'm going to do that a week from this Wednesday at 4 p.m., so that's uh, the 20th. Um, and I will, again, send out an announcement with a form um, for people to put in questions and topics for me to uh, start off with. Um, Friday is the uh, last uh, tech board uh, meeting uh, where we'll be uh, finishing up uh, the budget uh, and the evaluation of the executive director. Uh, and then lastly, we did find out at the beginning of uh, this week that um, we are going to receive uh, $345,607 uh, courtesy of the CARES Act. Uh, that money is uh, destined to be used to uh, help close gaps uh, and, you know, assist with learning going forward uh, in the face of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, so we are, just today, uh, our grant writer, Patty, was was in a webinar about that, um, that um, grant. It's more like a Title I grant. Um, there's a lot of flexibility with how we use it. Uh, but then we're going to have to put something together. So we're going to be meeting later on this week, early next week, to talk about that uh, and put in our paperwork. But that will give us some flexibility to do some of the things that we had talked about doing with kids once we can get to um, another level or, you know, remote learning 4.0 or whatever the heck it's it's going to be. Um, the other um, kind of distressing news, and, and Aaron kind of uh, – you know, uh, spoke a little bit to it is that, you know, we are not expecting uh, guidance from the DSE or the governor uh, on the 18th. Um, it will take longer before we get that. So that is uh, becoming stressful because we are looking at summer programming and what the fall would possibly look like. Um, the best thing we have to go on right now is the uh, CDC um, recommendations that came out about a week and a half ago recommending uh, you know, desks spread out six feet, uh, children not eating in cafeterias, separations on buses, and that sort of thing. So those are obviously things that we have starting to think about, but we're still waiting for what that guidance uh, will be for an opening of school. But it is looking like it probably will not be a regular uh, normal opening of school just for everybody out there. So that's, uh, that's all I have at this point in time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Any questions from the committee on any of those things? No? All right. Uh, so now moving along to budget. Uh, so Ms. Sheridan has a number of things to share with us this evening that is in our um, Google packets. Uh, we have an FY20 budget update. Uh, we have an update on a number of the revolving funds and also a report on COVID-19 expenditures so far. Uh, so, Ms. Sheridan, what would you like to share with us first? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm going to try this way, but I have my phone ready. So if it doesn't work, I'm giving up on this and going to phone. Um, so I'm going to start with the budget. 
Um, so I've made a lot of progress with coding the, ex the errors in the payroll and the expenditures to date, um, moving the FY20 budget to align properly with the Dusty function codes with the FY21 budget. Um, I do still have a little bit left to do. So you might see um, an account. One example is in the 1450 area, which there was um, a, a contingency fees application software where you have a large negative balance, but that's only because it's going to be recoded down to the 4,400, which is a technology area, um, which has a large positive balance. So I'm still working on that. Um, luckily, I had a lot of analysis in my public, public sector days um, to give me uh, experience here for this job. Um, I've asked all the payable clerks and the secretaries to come through their purchase orders um, and to close out any purchase orders that they do not need anymore that need to be closed out. I'm hoping they're working on that. Uh, we did send out an open purchase order report, um, but I am seeing, uh, for example, that the utilities still have some purchase orders that appear to be open. So I'm going to be sending that out again um, in the morning to get them to work on that. Um, the general fund uh, right now, I have put in um, an estimate of the um, payroll encumbrances to date, um, because as you know, with the new MUNA system, um, it's not able to encumber those pay that payroll until next year because we have a split payroll, one in an old system, one in a new system. But the report does have an estimate of the payroll encumbrances. Um, so, uh, the FY20 budget of $49,415,540, uh, currently with an estimate of the payroll encumbrances, the general fund would have a negative balance of 266887 um, If I apply my circuit breaker revenue um, to uh, the out of district tuition in this amount, um, then obviously you'd be down to a zero balance. And that will leave in your circuit breaking account uh, an estimate of your year end of $1,831,803. Um, last year, you ended this circuit breaker with $1,604,093, which is an additional $227,710 in circuit breaker if um, it ended up this way at the end of the year. Um, your circuit breaker, uh, you started the year FY19 with 1,604,093. Uh, the reimbursements that you have gotten to date are 1,578,580. Um, the out of district tuition that I've applied towards the circuit breaker thus far is 1,604,970. Uh, it's in the current balance in circuit breaker is 1,577,703. Uh, we still have the fourth quarter payment outstanding in the amount of $529.87. Um, so with the total fourth quarter that your balance to date would be $2,098,690. Um, the, the circuit breaker that I've applied to date is the, um, you have two years to spend your circuit breaker. So the, the circuit breaker that you have to spend this year, I have already applied towards um, the general fund. So any circuit breaker that I have right now can be carried over to the next year. Um, so um, that would be some decisions that we'd have to make if we're going to decide to hold on to some more circuit breaker, especially given the fact that um, special education in the FY21 budget um, appears to have been uh, the large larger increase for that. Um, I guess my recommendation would be to try to hang on to as much circuit breaker as you can, especially given the, circ the circumstances and the um, uncertain uncertainty that we have um, with the FY20 budget with the COVID-19 um, closure and the crisis. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to note about this is um, the bus contract. Um, where we had the amended bus contract, um, I have put in the encumbrances in the general fund um, to pay for the entire bus contract, contract in the general fund to try to hang on to some more of your bus fees um, in the revolving fund. As you know, in FY21, the general fund offset for the school bus fees, we increased from 300,000 to 400,000. Um, and again, with the current situation where we're not sure um, 
And a lot of the revolving funds uh, are missing some revenue this year. Um, I felt like that might be a good idea to hold on to that revenue in the bus contract um, revolving. And then you'd definitely be able to handle that four hundred thousand if we um, if we pay the rest in the general fund and hang on to it in the revolving. Um, I'll be going over more of the balances in the revolving um, in the next report, but I just wanted to give you a little bit about that on um, paying all of the school bus contract in the general fund. Um, the uh, the COVID nineteen account. Um, I can. I'll discuss that a little bit here. Um, the account account was set up for um, the COVID-19 um, crisis and shutdown to, to put, into put in expenditures for payroll and other expenditures that were incurred um, as a direct result of the COVID-19 crisis and the shutdown of the schools. So for an example, um, a revenue stream that you lost during this period of time, which caused you not to pay some of your payroll, um, then that payroll we have put into this COVID-19 account. Uh, some of the other expenditures in the COVID-19 account um, would be um, some of the um, cleaning supplies that are over and above, um, some of the sanitizing. We've got some payroll for um, food service delivery that some of the custodians were doing. Um, we've got expenditures for Chromebooks, computers um, that were to help with the um, the learning at home, the at home learning, and also the working at home. Um, so that um, account right now currently has a negative balance of one hundred and fourteen thousand two hundred and forty eight, but it is still climbing. So um, that's that was as of um, I believe it was May tenth. Um, so uh, those expenditures are only going in in there if they're directly related to the COVID nineteen shutdown. Um, so I just wanted to give you an update on that COVID-19 account. Um, the, does anybody have any ex, uh, questions on the budget to date? Um, I know there are. Oops, there it is. <laughs> she had a good stretch going. <laughs> It's oh, Karen, are you back? Am I not here again? Oh, we can hear you now. Okay, <laughs> I was doing so good. You <laughs> were. <laughs> so, were there any questions for Karen so far on what she covered with the um, budget to date? No. I did put note. Uh, if you look at the report, you will see notes on the side um, that I try to put notes on some of the expenditures that I, you might have questions on. So I'll continue to do that um, as we get through the end of the year and next year. Again, mm -hmm. one of the things that um, I definitely want them to come through is the um, the utilities because I just before I got on here, I noticed one had a large um, uh, encumbrance and. It's just no way that that encumbrance is actual. So I need the um, the uh, the bookkeepers and the um, the secretaries to comb through the purchase orders. That way, they can release some of the money that's tied up in purchase orders, and then we might be able to have some money to spend um, in the next few weeks. I, I know last year um, some of the money I think was left on the table not combing through those purchase orders and releasing what you do not think you're gonna spend it through the year. So I, I definitely, we've sent out the reports. I just don't think that they've, they've completed it yet. Okay. All right. Yeah, Dr. Um, Thompson. Yeah, can I just add, so just so just one, uh, one, one quick thing. So we're in this situation where we're gonna need certain kinds of supplies. And if we don't order them soon, we probably wouldn't have them for the beginning of the school year. Uh, like, you know, and, and Aaron spoke a little bit about this, like, you know, like the spray di disinfectants, you know, masks for, for kids should they come to school, these sorts of things. So we need to 
So we're going to be looking towards towards that, and and you know, whenever we do get to reopen, um, be able to you know try to use some of these funds the end of this year to make sure we are provisioned and able. Because I mean, because if we wait till July to order, well, there's a very good chance we'll be back ordered for some of these things. So um, right. it's a very unique situation. Um, you know, and and really figuring out exactly where we are and how to strategically spend some of that money now, so that we get it in a reasonable amount of time, so we have it when we need it, whenever that may be, is a little different than it has been in the past. So, okay, um, so moving on to the revolving funds. Yes, please. Um, okay. Um, I did a really thorough analysis of your revolving funds. Um, so um, I'd like to go over each one uh, and um, give you a little bit of an idea of what's in each revolving fund and what the balance is to date. Uh, so the first one I just went over, which was the COVID-19 fund. Um, the circuit breaker, um, the current balance, as I indicated in the circuit breaker fund is 1,577,703. Um, for those who are not aware of what the circuit breaker fund is, uh, that holds a revenue from the special education reimbursement program. And the districts um, are reimbursed for the SPED program costs that are more than four times the statewide foundation budget and up to 75% of the cost above the threshold subject to appropriation. Uh, the revenue from that that is in this um, revolving account can only be used for out of district SPED tuition. Um, you have a custodial overtime account. The current balance in that is 2,035. Uh, the revenue stream here is, for example, like um, the youth basketball renting some space at the high school. Um, and the expenditures in this account are the overtime custodial cost during the time that the youth basketball rents the space. Um, so that's the custodial overtime. So usually that's an in and out, in and out um, expenditure usually is in and out. Um, your athletic revolving account, uh, this is the one that has your athletic gate receipts. Um, it, the expenditures in this account included uh, police detail uh, for the games, and also there was some line painting for the field hockey. Um, the current balance in that account is 35162 uh, you have a summer school account, which um, it, the revenue stream is from the summer school fees. Um, it's used to cover the costs of the summer school teacher stipends and also some of the expenses for summer school. Uh, that currently has a balance of zero. Um, your school insurance recovery fund. Um, that This is for, set up for the insurance claims. So if you get it, if you have an insurance claim, the money that you get from the insurance company would be put in here, and then any of the expenditures um, for that claim would go against this account. Uh, currently, you have a balance of one thousand seven forty-two in this account, and the only accident there's a bus accident that appears to be what was put into this um, revolving account and the expenditures against the bus accident. You have school books and materials revolving account. Uh, the current balance in this is $2,993. Um, I'm assuming um, that this is set up for if you have lost books. Usually somebody loses a book and then they have to per buy that book. It's usually that, and that's usually a very small revolving account. Um, the JHN revolving account, this is where you have rental um, at the Savage Center. Um, your current balance is 28912 In FY20, the general fund offset for this account is 25000 So you see right now the balance is 28912 28, You have to have 25000 in there to cover for next year. So that would be one to watch. Um, the 25000 offset is for a 0 0.50 full-time custodian. Um, the Again, the budget revenue stream here is um, the rent at the Savage Center. You have an extended day rent. You have enable early intervention rent. You have WIC and you have Head Start. Um, it's used to cover um, not only that 0.5 full-time custodian, but it's also used to cover some general maintenance supplies, um, some custodial supplies. 
you have um, a very small gas bill at the salvage coming out of that Savage Center. Um, your student activities revolving fund, it currently has a balance of 54,700. Um, this fund includes revenue and expenditures for field trips, um, for fine arts performances. Um, it also has some testing. Um, if they charge for testings, um, maybe the PSATs or something like that, those all go into this revolving account. Um, you have the school bus fees. Um, the current balance in this one is the one that I indicated before is $513,090. Um, the offset for FY21 is $400,000. So um, there's about 113,000 over and above that offset currently. Um, the revenue from this, again, is, is from the um, fees for the buses, um, for the students who pay for, to ride the bus. Um, and the expenditures in here um, is you have a copy machine lease for transportation that comes out of here, and that is um, 1,042 through April, you have you purchased your cameras for your special education vans out of here, and that was thirty five thousand. Um, and then you have some miscellaneous in the amount of three thousand six eighty nine. Um, your school athletic user fees, um, the current balance is forty five thousand six hundred and twenty nine. The FY twenty one offset is one hundred thousand. So that current balance right now is kind of small. So that is another one that I'd wanna watch. Um, the revenue from here is your athletic user fees and the expenditures included some officials pay, some various athletic expenses, the cell phone for the athletic director and some athletic transportation. Um, you have the Chromebook insurance. Uh, that has a current balance of 42,483. The revenue here is it's $30 per student and it's optional if a student wants to buy insurance for their Chromebook. So if they buy the, the insurance and the Chromebook needs repairs or needs to be replaced, they have the, the insurance that will cover that. If they do not cover, buy the insurance for that Chromebook, then the student will be liable for any replacement or repair to the Chromebook. Um, expenses that have been uh, out of this Chromebook insurance revolving were some Chromebooks, some, some parts, some hotspot renewal, and some Chromebook software. Um, your building rental has a current balance of 33,815. Is it just me? No, it's not just you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> she was almost through the whole report. She was so close. <laughs> Are there questions from the committee on anything you've heard so far that um, we can discuss or that Dr. Thompson might be able to help answer? No. I don't really have a question, but I'd just like to say that I'm thrilled to be getting this level of detail. I think it's really helpful to see everything that's going on in the revolving account. It's, um, you know, something that we have not always seen in the past. Um, and sometimes some of the um, payroll expenditures that are going out of revolving accounts have not been obvious to us. And so, um, you know, there's a question about the um, extended day payroll and, you know, has this been reviewed and um, the, you know, there's a question about like, well, should we have raised fees before for extended day because to help the budget, but the extended day has always been self-funding and we have, the school budget has not been subsidizing it. 
um, and the school budget can't be taking money away from it if we mm -hmm. can't be raising fees for extended day and using that to subsidize the budget. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that we just hadn't been getting a really great accounting of what was going in and out of that budget. And so mm -hmm. I'm just really pleased that Karen is taking the time to go through this with us. Yeah, I agree. My, I mean, this is important information for us to have, and I, and I know she's worked really hard on this report, and I, you know, anticipate and expect that we'll continue to now get reports um, at this detailed level um, moving forward. Um, I have one question, and, and maybe, um, you know, Maya and, and Dr. Thompson, we covered this already in the Budget Subcommittee, and I'm just not um, remembering that it's possible that we may have talked about it, but with the Athletic Revolving Fund, um, since the offset, I know it's here that the FY21 offset was 100,000, but what did we budget the offset this year? Was it the same? I can look it up. <laughs> I figured you would have your budget book with you, Maya. Mine is in another room than what I'm in, but I had a feeling you had it there. <laughs> Mine is <laughs> mine is behind my desk in Norwood, so it's a yeah. little. <laughs> mine is downstairs in my dining room, and if I go down there, you might have my eight-year-old uh, hanging out with you in the interim. So I uh, better stay in the room that I'm in. <laughs> it was ninety thousand dollars for FY twenty. Ninety thousand, thank you. Yeah. And um, where she has listed that some of the. Um, Revolving fund for our athletics was supposed to go towards athletic transportation. Um, the bus contracts that we already settled and are paying a portion on, not the full thing, did that include athletic transportation or is the athletic transportation a separate issue? It, it's something that uh, the, the bus fee is in the bus contract. Okay. There, there's a fee structure in the bus contract for any bus that we rent for athletics or field trips or anything like that. Okay. That's any time we're using the the large buses, which is most of the cases for yeah. for athletics. I think that there is some stuff that maybe some of the smaller teams in the fall were trying we're using the special education vans sometimes if they could or the smaller buses that Norwood owns, but yeah. but the Connolly buses are um yeah, included in the regular contract. Golf team, I think, is the only one that actually uses the smaller buses. Maybe the tennis team, but I think the golf team. It looks like there were four revolving funds that Karen didn't uh, finish taking us through. That is in the written report she submitted to all of us, but I can I can read through it. I, I think I have a pretty good understanding. <laughs> of it and then you know we can um, you know talk about it and uh, you know my other dot com so if you have more information um if you didn't yet cover the extended day revolving fund um but we have been talking about that revolving fund a lot recently um so the current balance there is only one thousand five hundred twenty seven dollars oh hi karen i'm telling you i have <laughs> such trouble with this technology um, no, I was just going to read through your report, but you can definitely continue now that you're back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have a couple couple more that I was, uh, I ended at extended day. Um, the preschool tuition, the current balance in the preschool tuition is $157,951. Uh, and the FY21 general fund offset is 160, $163,000. And that includes um, some payroll for one teacher and 2.8 paras. Um, so the revenue from this is the preschool tuition fees. Um, and again, this is one of the revenue streams that's been halted uh, due to the COVID-19. So that's another area we're going to have to watch. Um, I'd like to try to hang on as, to as much as this as I can because the current balance is only 157. Um, the expenditures that go through here, and in addition to the the salaries is the Rizzo copy machine at the LMPA. Um, the music revolving uh, account is current balance of 31,171. Um, and this one is where you have the revenue from your music lessons as well as some donations. Um, the offset for the general fund FY21 budget is 15,000. 
Uh, you also have a drama operational, which has a current balance of 15567 And the FY21 general fund offset is 15000 again. And this particular one has revenue from drama fees as well as some donations. Um, the I did get a question um, from Maya about where the um, music lessons appear to be going into. And from what I looked at, it looked like they might be going into a couple of different areas. They um, either the music revolving or the student activity one seems to be a little bit of a um, mishmash of different things going in that one. Um, and if you guys have any questions, I could hear you, but I couldn't. For some reason, I was muted. So <laughs> if you have questions for me, I can answer them now. <laughs> Any questions at this point for Karen? No, Karen, everyone's shaking their head. No, um, I don't know if you if you heard Maya, though, we were, you know, she was saying, and I think we all agree that we thank you so much for this detailed report um, that you put together. Oh, you're welcome. So I believe those are the three items you wanted to talk to us about tonight under budget. Was there anything else for Sheridan? Uh, no, those are the only three that I had. Um, I think we have a couple more that we'll be going through next week. Um, but mm -hmm. I mean, the next school committee meeting, but for this week, those are the ones that I had. All right, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so welcome. now we're moving on to old business. Uh, Dr. Thompson, the 2020-2021 um, school year calendar. Yes. Uh, so as everyone will remember, the uh, marathon on Patriots Day was uh, canceled. Uh, they are now rescheduling Marathon Monday for September 14th. Uh, the state has made that a state holiday, uh, which means that we need to put that onto our calendar, which then would push our last days, 180, 185, out um, one day. So we've got the seventh is Labor Day. The Monday after would be, I don't even know what to call it, Patriots Day, Fall Patriots Day, Marathon Monday, I'm not quite sure. Uh, that would uh, push us with everything else remaining the same from uh, the 180th day being the 18th of June to now being uh, the 21st and the 185th day going from the 25th, Friday the 25th to Monday the 28th. So I would ask the committee to consider that uh, and vote for that change of the calendar and i guess should the uh we'll leave the caveat in there that should the uh, marathon not be able to be run on that 14th that we would have school on that day and go from there but so just one question for you and uh dr wyeth i know when you were putting together the original calendar there was a lot of discussion amongst the administrative team around <laughs> the way we did have it structured so that the last day will end on a Monday. But now with this, it does have us end on a Monday. Well, it, it, it was going to end on a Friday. It was going to end on a Friday, but that's only if you didn't have any snow days. So, Yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that's a major consideration at this point. No. Okay. I mean, I also yeah. understand there's so much still yeah. up in the air and the chance yeah. that they're running the marathon on September 14th is probably very slim in my opinion. Um, other questions, feedback, or a motion from the committee? Yeah, Dave. I'll make a motion to um, have the day off as a state math holiday, should it go forward. A second on that motion? I second. I'll second it. Okay, so I think Joan said it first by a second, so seconded by Joan. Um, but further discussion from the committee? All in favor? All right. All right. All right, 5-0. Okay, so we will, uh, we will make that revision and put a double asterisk on the 14th and uh, publish the calendar, so. All right, thank things you. I, things I never thought I, I'd be doing, so it's, it's, the list just keeps getting longer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so next on our agenda under old business, um, we started to discuss in previous uh, 
meetings and also in executive sessions around the extended day employees compensation. Um, we recently approved their compensation through May 4th, um, but we did have to finish the discussion around their compensation uh, for the rest of the school year. Um, questions, discussion, motion from the committee on this topic? I'm, I'm sorry. Just... Yeah, you cut out. <laughs> what? Can you hear me? Better. Yeah. No, uh, so, so I don't know what you heard or what you didn't hear. Uh, so I'll just repeat it all. Um, but next item is the extended day employee compensation. And so far as the committee, we've approved compensation through May 4th. So we do have to finish the discussion that we started in previous meetings and previous executive sessions around um, the payment for the rest of the school year. So any questions, discussion, or motion? Mara? Uh, yeah, so taking into consideration the memo that we received in correspondence from General Manager Tony Mazzucco, I will make a motion to pay the extended day employees through the end of the year. Thank you, Mara. Is there a second on that motion? Happy to second. And just to clarify, you mean at the end of the school year, Mara? Yes. OK. So motion by Mara, second by DA. Further discussion from the committee? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, 5-0. Thank you. All right, moving along. Uh, we do not have anything under policy, um, but Joan and I did touch base earlier that we are going to be um, setting up a policy subcommittee meeting. Uh, so Lori and Karen, just look for an email from us on that soon uh, so we can reconvene some policy work. And then at one of the next meetings, we will have more policies for the full committee. Uh, so next is new business. Uh, so Dr. Thompson, your Student Opportunities Act plan. Yes. So uh, let me um, bring up my slides here. Can everyone see that? Yes. Good. That was that was easy. Uh, let me just remember how to uh, present. Uh, oh, here it is. There we go. All right. So, uh, you know, we've we've gone through this. We've we've actually approved the budget for this as part of our budget process. Um, and I did um, share with the committee, uh, you know, a full narrative. But for those folks at home, I wanted to kind of just go through uh, what we're looking at to do with the student activity, uh, student opportunities act uh, plan. And uh, we'll just kind of go through this. So, you know, what is the Student Opportunities Act plan? It's an increase in Chapter 7 in funding, uh, and it's, it's, it's the result of a revised formula that takes into account student demographics, um, health insurance increases for staff, and special education increases. This is the new budget, this is the new uh, funding formula for the state that was a two and a half year process to get um, figured out and voted in. Uh, nor would this for next year originally in our first uh, set of numbers from the state uh, saw an increase of 1.53 million in chapter 70 funding for FY21. In this uh, Student Opportunities Act was a requirement that portion of that money uh, would be used to um, would be used to uh, identify an underperforming subgroup uh, and create a plan to address uh, the needs and bring them up to uh, you know achieving at the level of their peers. So our required spending uh, is about 575,000 out of that 1.53 million that we received in chapter 70 money. So this is money from the state that we have to devise a plan for to close an achievement gap. So we have uh, decided as a administrative team to look at the special education subgroup. Um, and obviously, you know, there's several reasons for this. One is that it is a lower performing uh, group than its typical peers. Uh, it represents about 20%, I believe it was 20.2% of our student population. Uh, that's a pretty big number. Uh, it basically, the special education subgroup is composed of every um, ethnic group and income level. So it kind of hits a couple other places besides just special education, but we're really going to focus on that. Uh, and we're gonna address it you know, at all three levels, elementary, middle, and high school in our school system. And what are we gonna do at the elementary level? We're looking to uh, improve our early literacy um, 
instruction and achievement in special in our special education population. Literacy is is a key component in early childhood and elementary uh, that um, influences future success. Uh, so we're going to imp implement a research-based early literacy program across the district, and this is our uh, new program that we've just uh, purchased for next year, as well as the foundations program. Um, with the foundations, we have started with that this past uh, year and a half, um, two years, but uh, we're, we want to increase the training and uh, continue uh, the implementation at a high level. Um, so we are going to um, use an intervention model, a tier two training in foundations, as well as Wilson training. And Wilson's, Wilson is a specific uh, intervention program for phonics and uh, teaching children who are having special ed processing issues with learning language. Um, we're going to embed training and professional development for all of our staff. Uh, we're going to use a progress monitoring and assessment system, part of which will be Renaissance, to measure and address student needs going forward on an ongoing basis. And part of this is also to hire a speech language pathologist to address uh, student needs, especially at the early childhood level. At the middle school, we really need to continue and bring our cooperative teaching model uh, up to full fruition. Um, we are limited in it. Currently, we've been doing training in it, but part of it is staffing and being able to arrange our schedule and our teams um, because of staffing to, to do it properly. What this looks like is that this is a special ed teacher and a regular ed teacher with special ed students and regular students in a classroom, and they co-teach. They work together and coach in a, in a team-like fashion in order to meet the needs of all the learners in the classroom. So we're going to use training to implement this uh, research-based instructional model. Uh, so tier one is universal, so all the students will be trained in co-teaching, um, and that will make our overall inclusion model stronger. Uh, tier two is an in-depth training for math and ELA teachers, and we're looking to have all of our, uh, all at least one class on all of our teams throughout the Coakley Middle School uh, be co-taught in math and English language arts. In order to do this, we would need to, and the SOA plan will will fund this higher or increase. Uh, 0.6 uh, full-time equivalents of a special ed teacher to uh, staff this co-teaching model. At the high school, we're seeing a significant increase uh, in students presenting with complex social-emotional uh, disabilities, and this is requiring mental health hospitalizations. We have had kind of a revolving doors of kids being hospitalized, coming back, going back out and being hospitalized. So we're looking to provide a therapeutic trauma-based program for this vulnerable population within Norwood High School. Uh, and you had the presentation a few weeks back from Effective School Solutions. Uh, they have a 10 year track record of successfully providing therapeutic clinical solutions to schools. Uh, the advantage of using a, uh, an organization like ESS is they bring this expertise, their protocols and procedures to the districts. They already have the model and how to implement it done. We don't have to, there's no, a very short uh, learning slope, learning curve on this. Um, and the nice thing about ESS is that they're also going to be providing district-wide um, professional development and trauma-informed practices, and that's going to help our overall approach to social-emotional disabilities and these instructional approaches uh, to reach what, what we are really seeing being a, a growing demographic. So the budget, you've seen it before. The, the, the nice thing about the Student Opportunities Act is we're supposed to spend uh, $575,000. Um, you can replace or supplant pieces that are in your regular budget. We are, we are replacing or supplanting $297,412. Uh, and I have kind of gone through and presented that uh, beforehand, but you can see where all of those um, costs are. So the next steps, um, the school committee has to approve the plan before it is submitted. Um, technically, right now, unofficially, they're saying the 15th, which is Friday. However, the commissioner has said that he is not asking anyone to submit on Friday. We're kind of waiting to see what and if the numbers change at all. Um, but, you know, so we're really not sure when we're going to need to submit but at least we have uh, gone through the process of, of having this approval. So we are ready to submit. If we do have to revise, then I would come uh, back before you and inform you of those changes uh, needed going forward. So 
I, I, I honestly don't expect the Student Opportunities Act to completely go away. It's whether uh, the amount of money that we're supposed to be spending or required to spend changes. Um, but with that, there's also now the HEROES Act uh, coming out of the House, which is uh, going to come to states to help close budget gaps for states. So we will um, see where that leaves us. So let me uh, close this out and uh, join all of you. I don't know if there are any questions. Um, again, I, I just wanted to go through that so the people at home had something to, to look at. I, you know, the narrative has uh, more detail in it than the, uh, than the PowerPoint, but if there's any questions uh, myself or Mrs. Cimino could answer, we are here. So Dr. Thompson, just like a timeline procedural question, um, it is required for the school committee to vote on the plan before you submit it. And they said the 15th, but as you just said, you're not expected to turn it in on Friday. You're kind of waiting to right. find out. Right. Um, but are you, you're seeking a vote tonight based on what you've shared so far, correct? Right. Based on, based on what we know right now, I am, I am seeking a, a final vote. And, and, and just to, just to remind the committee, we did, we did approve the SOA budget as part of the budget process. But again, we might not know you know, if these numbers will change until the middle, I mean, there's some people that are saying we're not going to know till the middle of July, um, you know, and they might decide that they're going to have us put, put this plan in and then have mm -hmm. to go back and revise it, which is what we do with grants. So. Right. And one other timeline question for you and then for Mr. Yeah. Nino, um, the effective school solutions contract, is that still expected to be signed by the end of May? As of right now, we're on hold with them. Okay, um, so they're just waiting as we are to find out more about funding, or yes, yeah, yeah. We're not gonna we're not gonna enter into a contract until we're absolutely sure that we can enter into a contract. Sure, I just wanted to, to clarify because I, I knew that initially there was that May thirty first, and then if we signed by then, there was some additional yeah. PD that they were going to give us, correct? Yeah, I, I'm in constant communication with them. I, in fact, I just spoke with them yesterday. Um, they sort of know the situation we're in um, with waiting on further guidance with the SOA. Um, and they know that, you know, it's sort of contingent on the funding coming from the SOA. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do, do you know, because um, I'm on their listserv, so I get a lot of the great emails that they send out. And I know they're doing a lot of like virtual and, and webinars and stuff around the COVID-19 and the trauma that students are experiencing. Um, are you aware at all? Are they planning on um, changing their service model or enhancing their service model to take into consideration this more global trauma that all of our students are going through? Is that any conversation that you've heard from them? We haven't discussed specifically, no. Yep. Okay. But that is, but that is, that is a general conversation of what kind of social emotional support are we going to need to offer when we are able to come together. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, and you know, the nice thing about a group from, you know, like, like ESS is that they would have, you know, training and materials that, that we could use, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, other questions? Oh, oh, Laura, did you have something? I was just going to say, I think more than ever, we're going to need their support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I, I'm really impressed with the resources. I see them already putting out. I mean, they've been very responsive to the oh, situation. Yeah. Like, the next day it happened, I, I saw that they were putting on events, and I figured yep. they were on top of it. But um, Other questions, concerns from the committee? I just Hi. like the motion to um, approve the SOA plan. Okay, great. Is there a second on that motion? Happy to second it by Joan. Okay, and then any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Was that a yes? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Five zero. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank so you. Dr. Thompson, I, I guess just keep us updated on <laughs> what you hear about timeline and budget. <laughs> will. Every day is an adventure. <laughs> and not to jinx you, but I bet you learn something tomorrow or Friday and then yep. we talk about it again. <laughs> All right. So at this point, we have a donation. Yep. 
Uh, we have a donation from the Orient Lodge uh, for a thousand dollars to Norwood High School and Teacher of the Year Teresa Drummy. Right. Is there a motion to approve this donation? Um, motion, motion to uh, approve, and also once again congratulate uh, Teresa Drummy on this achievement. Is there a second? Seconded. Thank you, Dave. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Great. So moving right along to school committee agenda. Uh, Mara, do you have anything this evening? Uh, sure. I have just a, a few things. Um, I wanted to just take a second to reiterate to folks within the community that if you do need food, that all of the neighborhood elementary schools are open uh, for you to go and to pick up food as you would need it. And if you are not able to get there, you can come contact the schools and the, the van drivers are able to bring to bring things by. And to that end, I just want to take a second to once again, thank our incredible food services staff, our incredible buildings and ground staff. And um, I know he doesn't like to appear before us, but Paul Riccardi um, for all of his efforts. Um, there's just been so many stories about folks who can't get to the schools because of their work schedule and that they're the only parent home and it's just not a problem. Okay, well, how many meals do they need? Do they need extra extra things? We can pick up a few bags of groceries and bring it by. And I think that, um, you know, there's just been so many instances that, you know, we could just go on and on um, within the town and within the schools of folks just not not questioning whether or not it can be done. It's just, well, it's something that needs to be done. Okay, we're going to do it to help people out and you know um as much as we can i think it's important to highlight those stories just to you know kind of sh shine a light on those folks who might not stand up and say all the amazing things that they're doing but uh deserve to have the the light shown on them so thank you yeah, absolutely thank you mara uh joan anything this evening um, Maura continues to uh, steal everybody's thunder and i would just like to echo everything that Maura said thank you <laughs> Dave Patania. Uh, nothing at this time that uh, Mora hasn't already said. Thank you, Mora. Okay. Uh, Maya. Um, I agree with Mora, and I also um, want to acknowledge again um, our seniors and all our students who are transitioning from one school to another. I know that there's um, a lot of work going on to try and get. Um, you know, do a virtual um, open house for students who are headed up to the middle school and um, things like that. And, you know, this Friday would have been the prom. And I, so I know that there's a sense of grief for a lot of our students and families. And um, I acknowledge that and I want to um, commend the high school on all their efforts that they're making to recognize this year's class, graduating class, even if we aren't going to have a traditional commencement. So thank you to everybody. Yeah, thanks, Maya. Um, just quickly reminders to the community out there, um, Impact Nord continues to be a really great resource, so please check their website. On Monday, we had a webinar on the um, pandemic quarantine for parents of K through fifth graders. Um, we had a good turnout live, but it is recorded, and um, I think it's a uh, it was a really good informative webinar that will help a lot of families with elementary kids. Um, if you're struggling, because we still have another month of all of this to go. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know about other parents, but uh, starting to feel a little um, impossible some days, but we will do what we can each day, day by day, right? <laughs> um, but just all you can do day by day. <laughs> Uh, and there are still, unfortunately, a lot of uncertainties ahead for all of us. So um, I'm just so grateful to be on this committee with the people that I am. And that includes my fellow school committee members, as well as all the administrators. I think that as hard as this is, we're working really well together. And um, Dr. Thompson has hired some great leaders. Um, and the people who are involved in these decisions um, matter greatly. So thank you to, to everybody. Uh, so at that point in time, um, it is 8.42. I was closer, Dr. Thompson, to when I said this meeting would end than, than you were, but uh, <laughs> I still think it was a productive meeting. <laughs> uh, but we do have to go into executive session at this time.
time um, to discuss some contract negotiations, um, but we will um, only be reconvening for the point of adjournment. We will not be coming back to discuss anything in public session tonight. Uh, so is there a motion to adjourn, enter executive, sec executive session, and only re-enter adjournment? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Maya. So I do have to poll everybody. Maya? Yes. Tomorrow. Should I abstain? Uh, I mean, sure, go into executive session. I'm cool. Yeah, you're not joining <laughs> us. But, no, uh... no, so that's why I wasn't sure. I mean, I vote yes. Do it. <laughs> you, just, you just won't be joining us for that discussion. I, that guess. I, I will vote yes, but I will it. be absent. Okay, great. <laughs> Joan? Yes. Dave. Yes. Dave yes. Okay. I'm a yes as well. Yes. So I will uh that's five zero. Uh, but I will see four of you and Dr. Thompson in executive <laughs> session. Um, and to everyone else, we will be back uh, live again on May 27th. So thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks.